from the south plant to irrigate the golf course. If you can divert some of this affluent from Salt Creek, could we limit the overall pollution pollutant load that Wooddale discharges without expensive plant upgrade or expansion? To answer your second question first, yes. Um, to answer your first question, I think I would let Carl talk to you to discuss that because we confronted the uh, DuPage County Forest Preserve about that exact question and they declined to take effluent from the south plant, but Carl could probably speak to that a little better than I could. Yeah, there, there's two concerns uh, with them. First of all, they spent a lot of money um, at digging an irrigation lagoon that takes water from Salt Creek, as I understand it, and then they, they use that water as their source for their golf course irrigation. So to throw that away after spending a lot of money on that back around 2000, um, that would be a tough decision for them. The second thing is, is that, as with any golf course, there's always concern about salt content in the wastewater, the, the, basically the chlorides that are in the wastewater effluent. Um, in Bloomingdale, we, we had approached uh, the, the manager of the Bloomingdale golf course we did some sampling and testing on that effluent from Bloomingdale, and it was marginal. Um, it, it could have been used. They would have had to take uh, some special precautions, like they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't use that water for irrigating greens um, because of the uh, potential for the buildup of salts, and which would ultimately uh, affect the, the growth of the grass, uh, especially on the greens. Uh, I think that was a concern that was raised by um, the Forest Preserve District on that. Forest Preserve District, it's, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, uh, whatever county I've been in, uh, we've asked the Forest Preserve District if they would allow us to irrigate their properties with effluent, and uh, they've refused us in almost every case. And it's just that they, they say it just doesn't fit in well with their mission. Well, I won't ask you what their mission is, other than we can presume it's to provide a good game of golf. But uh, there's a lot of thicket on golf courses. There just aren't fairways and greens. There's woods and uh, thickets. Yeah. So that water wouldn't, you know, wouldn't present the problem in that area. Uh, which average, gets back to the question, if you can use that, mm -hmm. that cuts down the need for a lot of the, the reason for the plant upgrade. That's, that's really not and I, true. I'd ask, is there any other area you see where you can dump water besides uh, golf courses? Are there other um, wild, wild lands that, that could uh, take it without the salt becoming a problem? Well, let me, let me address... First of all, um, the situation with, um, with the treatment plant itself. Regardless of whether you discharge it into the waterway or you discharge it onto land, you're still going to have to expand the treatment capacity of your plants to meet whatever your projected load is. If it's 5 million gallons a day, you have to expand it to 5 million gallons a day. You still have to treat that water to a certain degree, okay? Now, golf courses, your general golf course, with a driving range, if it irrigates fairways, rough, and the driving range, will take, on average, about 30 million gallons a year. On a very dry year, like we had in 2005, you would expect that number to go to 45 to 60 million gallons a year. Now, you'd think that would be a lot of water, right? How much flow? You're averaging just under two MGD, Okay, or right, right around 2 MGD total combined, all right? 2 million gallons a day, 365 days a year, you're at 730 million gallons a year, and you're going to put 30 million gallons on the golf course. That's a small fraction, about 5% of the total. So, yes, it can reduce the amount of pollutants that are going into the receiving stream, but it, it's not by a high percentage. Now, if you had a lot of golf courses or you had a lot of uh, land that you could irrigate, yes, you can, you can substantially reduce that. But on a land application system, let's say we're going to build a land application system where we take all of our effluent 
and we put it on land. You need about 200 acres for every million gallons of a million gallons per day of wastewater treatment capacity. So if you, you currently have a 3.1 million gallon uh, capacity, combined capacity treatment plants, to stop discharging, you would have to acquire 600 acres of irrigable land. Do you have 600 acres uh, laying around someplace that we could spritz water on? <laughs> it, it just isn't around. Yeah. Alderman Wesley. I'll ask our, our staff there. With you running the treatment plant the way you do, do you feel that we need a new treatment plant or do you think we could get by with the expansion? Personally, I feel we could get by with an expansion. Okay. May I do two other follow up questions or? Yes, to wrap it up. The question I had is this, I happen to not make the last engineer, but one of Alman is missing tonight, and, and, and this was a vital question. Um, do you think if we double stack our buildings, our office up top, that we could get the capacity out of that treatment plant there with the expansion? You know, I, I really don't, don't know. I, we've been tossing this around at the office about what, um, where, where you would need capacity. I mean, your, your south plant there has capacity of 1.13 MGD. Current flow to it is? Uh, the south plant? Yeah, half a, half a million gallons a day. I mean, you've got quite a bit of capacity left there. Do we really need to expand anything down there? Uh, I think most of your, your growth, especially if it's going to come from the O'Hare Western Access Project, is going to be tributary to the north plant. All right, so that's where, where your expansion would really need to take place. Um, and perhaps, you know, we, we've talked about, uh, hey, if, if we've got excess capacity down at the south and we don't have enough capacity here at the north, perhaps we could offload some of that load to the south plant. So that was one of the questions that, that uh, uh, or one of the concepts that we've, we've been dealing with. Um, yes, if, if space is at a premium, there are things you can do to stack. I mean, that's what they do in Japan. They, they build vertically rather than But have horizontal. you done one yet, stacking it? Pardon? Have you done one stacked it yet? I mean, we've, we've built uh, buildings over tanks, but I can't say that we've really stacked a... Uh, no, not two tanks. To my knowledge... No, I, I'm talking about yeah. putting a building on, on, over the tank. We could do that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's been done. Okay. The other question is, uh, there was a comment made in the last meeting about with the Western Access coming, is there a chance that we might be able to build a third treatment plant or satellite station, pop it over to uh, Metro Sanitation District in Elk Grove, have we looked at that option? Yeah, that, that's a possibility. Um, we we uh, investigated that for Itasca. The one thing that MWRD said to us was that Itasca must have part of the village in Cook County. Otherwise, they could not do it. Okay. All right. Does, uh, does Wooddale have any portion of its community in Cook County? No, I know that. I know the answer to that question already. You know, so that, that's problematic for MWRD okay. because their charter is Cook County. Okay. Yeah. Now, let me, let me also talk about a third treatment plant. Yes, a third treatment plant is possible. We could, we could build a third treatment plant out there. A problem with the third treatment plant is getting that discharge permit. You're asking for a new discharge permit into an impaired waterway, Salt Creek. That will be very difficult. That will be a di very difficult hurdle to come. Uh, one, of the, one of the concepts that was reiterated this week at WEFTEC was something called sewer mining, where you take water out of the sewer to reuse in, a, in, a, in an area like, let's say your industrial area, uh, maybe, maybe the new hotels could be built to uh, use reused water, non-potable water, for flushing all their toilets. You know, we can, we can take water out of the sewer system and reuse it there so it never reaches the plant. Now the solids have to continue down. You have, if you take out solids, you put them back in the sewer and they, they find their way down to the plant. So, it's a possibility here. You could build a third plant without a new discharge permit, keep the water up there, if you could find enough reuse for it, 
and send the solids down to the north plant. Of course, you'd have to ha you might have to expand the solid treatment capacity down here at the, the existing plant. Okay. Hey, could you give me a ballpark figure what a study may, may cost us on this, this ballpark? What are we looking at? Let me ask Carl a question here, and I'll do it. Uh, what did the uh, study of the new plant cost? Uh, the new plant uh, was, uh, I think the first phase was uh, 30 some thousand dollars, as I recall, 35, 38, something like that. And then we spent another equal amount in phase two. Most of that went to soils analysis. Uh, TFC did some soil borings out there. It was about 60,000. Yeah, I yeah all, overall yeah. it was about, it was new about studies. 60 grand. But what do you ballpark this may cost to do the study? Now that I you've seen the treatment the plants and all that. You think it'd be the same? More than? Less than? I, it's hard to say because I just have, I have not put pencil and okay. paper on there. Thank you. That's what it is. I, my guess is it would be similar right. in nature. I think it could be similar in nature. Um, we know a lot about your current flows and loads and a lot of the other background information is necessary for us to develop has already been done because we're doing it as part of the first study that we did for you. Yeah. Um, we know your, your staff. Um, we've got your operating reports. We've done a lot of other things with them. Yeah. I, will, I will say this. If, if you add to the scope the um, projection of your population and, and projection of your ultimate flow, that costs us a lot of money. That's a lot of effort on our part because we really have to look at your comprehensive plan, work through what, uh, what uh, is foreseen as development, um, and figure out exactly where things are, are going to develop or redevelop if you've got some redevelopment plans. That takes, unfortunately, a lot of man hours to, to work through that. So that could significantly raise the price if you add that to our scope. Okay. okay. Thank you. Alderman Coles. I got... Uh, our problem, one of our problems about water in the, in the sewer lines is uh, illegal hookups in the sump pumps. And uh, <clears throat> we have quite a few people that do that. Instead of having it going in the backyard, they put it in the sewer line. And that's uh, one of our problems if we could only stop some of them, especially in a rainstorm, the sewer lines get overloaded with the water being pumped in from the sump pumps. And that's uh, something that they've been working on, I don't know how many years. Uh, and I think we could control some of the water just by trying to catch some of these people. But the problem is, is they, they know the people are coming around and they hook them back up outside. As soon as the people has gone, they hook them back up to the sewer line. And this is the only way you could catch them is by going there in the rainstorm and seeing if there's water coming out of the back of the house and then go from there. But this is one of the problems we have with the sewer lines filling up with water that is not helping. Uh, that's one of the things I wanted to talk, say. Yeah, uh, St. Louis, the St. Louis equivalent to the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, I forget what their name is, but they did a study some years ago and, and to, to figure out um, how they could get people to disconnect their sumps. And what they found was that the only way they really got people to disconnect the pumps is if they reconnected that sump pump directly to a storm sewer. Otherwise, you know, if they, if they just put, the, put the, uh, the, the sump pump discharge on the ground or if they ran it to the road, eventually... The homeowner would get tired of that wet spot, whether it be on the ground or on the road, and they would hook back up to the sanitary sewer. But if they gave them a permanent connection to a storm sewer, then it didn't change. So if you really want to solve the problem, go in and hook those, uh, those illegal connections up to the storm sewer. Thank you very much. Right, and, and um, we have communities that uh, put that in their subdivision code. So when developments are being done, they put in a... Uh, PVC pipe typically in the backyard and they connect their sump pumps to that pipe and when they run the pipe out to the street they connect that pipe to the storm sewer so the resident never recognizes the fact that that sump pump is going to the storm sewer it never causes a problem in the winter time of icing or anything like that it's a fairly simple change in your code to accomplish 
Doesn't cost very much for the developer because he's typically putting that utility down the backyards. Pretty safe PVC pipe, and it can it can eliminate problems in the sewer that, line. The sewer line. Um, in Minnesota, where my mom and dad lived, um, they allow people to connect to the um, sanitary sewer in the winter time, but in the in the spring, summer, and fall, they're forced to discharge outside because one of the big problems with year-round discharge outside is icing in the wintertime. And uh, to prohibit that, they do allow that. And it's typically not the wet weather periods that you get all and I, high flows. All I wanted to say was that that, that can so solve some of the water problem that we're getting in. Right. Some pumps can be a significant problem and almost impossible to try to eliminate. Other communities are um, going in uh, at the time of sale of house to inspect the inside plumbing of the house, require the seller to make sure that it is up to code. Yes, sir. I'd like to wrap this up. If I don't mean to cut you off, but I know you want to make a statement, so okay, want to give everybody equal time. So all right, ahead. I appreciate that. I'm about two minutes over. Well, maybe you guys had talked a little bit at the beginning, so I got I got I just got two things I want to say. Um, first of all, I, I neglected to mention. Um, and what I was talking about our staff, I, I don't know if you remember one of the first slides that showed our names, and there was a couple of initials afterwards. One was PE, which is professional engineer. Um, the other one was BCEE. Um, Carl and I both had that. That is board certified environmental engineer. Um, our company has for years promoted the extra education, extra effort for uh, people who have been trained in wastewater handling to become a board certified environmental engineer, which means that we take a test, we sit down in front of an exam board, and we explain what, what experience we've got and how we would handle different things. Um, I looked on the list of Illinois um, um, board certified environmental engineers. Our company's got five, um, more than the competitors for in this situation. Um, the other thing that I, that I wanted to say is uh, we commend you for doing qualification-based selection. We think it is the best way to hire a consultant. Um, the only suggestion I, I would like to make is that you consider the selection of your consultants based upon the type of engineering work. So if, if we satisfy you that we are the best qualified for your wastewater treatment plant planning and design, that we would do these projects. And a different engineer may be the best for your transportation work. And a third engineer might be the best for your general municipal things like plan reviews and so forth. And so you may have different engineers who are specialized because we are specialized. Today's day and age, people have to be specialized because of the complexity of the laws and the complexity of the environment for getting permits. And we think we are the best qualified for this particular assignment, for this village, this city, excuse me, because we, uh, we not only understand the landscape of the process to get permission, we know the players that are involved, and we have very highly skilled people on staff to try to help the city through this process. So with that, we would love to do this work for you. We think we could do a great job for you. We think we could turn this around in a pretty short time because we've already got a lot of knowledge about your wastewater treatment plants and firsthand working relationship with your staff. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate that. Are there any last minute questions? Nope, time's up. Did pretty good, am I okay? That's right. good. Thank you for your right. time and thanks for coming out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Recess. All right. We need to make a motion for recess. Uh, to recess. recess five. Jeff is. Nice to meet you. Let the minute, minute taker reflect that all members are still here, that we're here earlier. And our next, uh, next firm up is a firm from Smith Engineering, Jason Poppin, Richard Herman, Ellen Swanson, Ed Coggin, and Mark Helm. You may proceed. Uh, you are going to have to use the microphone, though, and pass that around. We do rebroadcast for the citizens. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you for allowing us to uh, to come in this evening and uh, and give our presentation. 
uh, it, I'm sure uh, it's been a, a, a couple couple days of uh, interviews here, and uh, we hope uh, we hope after our presentation uh, we'll uh, we'll identify our qualifications and uh, and proceed. Um, wanted to talk a little bit before we get in about the firms uh, and why uh, we have to have teamed uh, a teaming agreement uh, with uh, Walter E. Deutschland Associates. Um, but we'll just briefly speak about the firms. Uh, SEC Group uh, is a multidisciplined uh, engineering firm. We were established back in 1981. And SEC is, is, was really based on uh, the core is municipal engineering. Um, since 1981, we've, uh, we've evolved and have uh, really uh, very well diversified our businesses to cover all aspects of, of uh, municipal engineering, including wastewater and water. Uh, that's one of our, our market sectors internally that we pr provide. Um, we have multiple other uh, disciplines in-house, transportation, uh, uh, water resources with respect to wetland uh, and drainage and, and things such as that, which we understand uh, uh, may be an issue, uh, something that of concern that we want to look at with, with the, these projects here in this feasibility study. Uh, we have offices. Um, and we also have uh, construction uh, engineering in-house. Uh, we, do, uh, we have a, a sister company that does uh, SCADA work and uh, controls and automation uh, for water, wastewater uh, facilities. Um, and, uh, and, and a few other disciplines as well, site civil, uh, surveying, and different things such as that. Uh, we have offices that kind of surround the Collar County area. We have offices in McHenry, which is our corporate headquarters, uh, downtown in Chicago. We also have an office in Yorkville and in New Lenox. Uh, so we've kind of got the... Uh, the Collar County is uh, surrounded here, and that provides us the ability to service our clients in a, in a much uh, better fashion. Uh, currently, we have a, just, just over 120 employees. Uh, 50 of those employees are licensed uh, professional engineers. Um, and so that, uh, we believe, uh, brings another distinct advantage to, to our firm. Now, with respect to Walter E. Deutschler, Walter E. Deutschler is a, is a specialized niche type firm. Uh, they really focus uh, specifically on uh, wastewater treatment facility uh, uh, facilities and planning and collection systems. They were established back in 1916, so they've been around a little bit longer than we have. Uh, but uh, they've had long-term relationships um, with many clients in the Fox Valley area and in this area. Um, uh, the Salt Creek Sanitary District is one of those clients uh, that they've uh, continued to do work for for over 50 years. Uh, so they're very well aware of... Uh, Salt Creek, which we uh, understand is a is a is an asset in this uh, community that we want to uh, we want to protect. Um, their office is located in, in Aurora, Illinois, and they have 30 employees, nine of which are uh, professional engineers. Um, so that those are just a real quick briefing of the firms. Um, now, why did we come together? Um, both firms uh, are qualified to come in on their own merit and own qualifications uh, to submit on a project such as this feasibility study. Um, but, but we also understood there was a little bit of some history in the, in the past uh, with respect to the, the study here. Um, and we wanted to make sure that when we looked at this, uh, at the, the north and the south plant, that we were, we were coming from, we were looking at it with, with open eyes uh, and, and uh, really starting from scratch to, to really come up with the best cost-effective solution uh, for the city of Wooddale. So we have two firms with different perspectives and different experiences, uh, both award-winning firms with respect to wastewater treatment facilities coming together for one team to provide and find the best of cost-effective solution for the city of Wooddale. Um, I mentioned the local experience with Salt Creek. Um, and for, in SEC, we, we've had the opportunity to work in Wooddale on some other projects. So we also have some local understanding of some other uh, uh, issues and some other priorities uh, for the city of Wooddale. A little bit about the project team. Um, and uh, I, I didn't introduce uh, the team members here, but I want to do that now and take the time while we take a look at the org chart here uh, that we put together. I'm Jason Poppin, and I am an officer of SEC, uh, an executive vice president of the company. Um, I've been with SEC for, for over six years, and prior to that, I was in the public sector. Um, I worked, at, I was a county administrator 
uh, in Kendall County prior to going to SEC. So have that public ex public ex sector experience as well now in the private sector. Um, so I've certainly have sat, in, uh, sat in your position before um, reviewing consultants and, and their qualifications to make these decisions. Um, I'll be uh, uh, just overseeing the project um, and, and if, uh, and if need be, then I'll be involved uh, with, with whatever aspect I would need to be. Uh, Rich Herman uh, is with us as well. And Rich, Rich has over 12 years experience and he's gonna be the project manager uh, for this project. He, uh, he leads our wastewater uh, group uh, in-house. He's our, he's our director of operations for uh, wastewater in-house. Um, and Rich comes with extensive municipal experience uh, and also extensive wastewater treatment uh, facility experience. So Rich is gonna be leading this team and, and has led and designed many wastewater treatment facility projects in the past. Also sitting with me here is, is Ed, Ed Coggin. And Ed, Ed has a few more, Ed has 23 years experience uh, with, uh, with, as an engineer. And, um, uh, and Ed is a technical manager in our, in our water wastewater group within SEC. Um, Ed's going to talk, and we're going to talk about a project that uh, Ed has recently done for, for the village of Richmond, which is a reuse design. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, with respect to the south plant today. Uh, Ed'll, Ed'll get into that. Mark Calm is the vice president of uh, Walter E. Deutschler and Associates. Um, he has 19 years of experience and uh, leads their, wa their wastewater design uh, group with the in-house of uh, water uh, Walter or, within Deutschler. Um, one is thing to point out about Mark is uh, he I mentioned Salt Creek and his firm having that experience. Well, he was actually the one who was the project manager and the, and the lead designer on uh, the Salt Creek project back in 2004, I believe. And uh, they, they actually won an all merit award in ACEC uh, for that project. So again, some proven experience uh, that Mark brings to, to, to Wooddale uh, locally in the area. Um, I also wanted to point out, I've, Mark's wearing the smallest shovel I've ever seen on his lapel, and maybe we can ask Mark about what, what that is a little bit later. <laughs> but, um, we also have on the team uh, various other disciplines uh, as they may be needed. Site civil work, uh, you know, we, if there's some things that we need to do uh, at, a, at a location, um, whether it be the north plant or the south plant, that we have to do something with the site to balance the site, or to change the site around a little bit. We'll have our site civil engineers uh, working with us on that. We also have surveying uh, available uh, in-house uh, at SEC. And uh, should there be any surveying needs, uh, we have the capabilities uh, readily available to, to provide those. Um, Stormwater uh, management is a big issue. Uh, we understand back in, the, I think it was July when we had those heavy rains that there, there was some potential flood control issues uh, at the North Plant. Uh, we have, uh, in-house, um, very well respected in uh, uh, stormwater management, uh, uh, water resources engineers in-house, uh, and they're very well respected by, they've been IDOT trained and, and, uh, and they, they, they represent numerous municipalities when it comes to stormwater uh, management issues. Um, and, and certain counties have certifications that you can, that you can get. Um, Lake County has one of them. Uh, Kane County is the other one, and we, they're both certified stormwater managers for both of those counties. DuPage County, uh, at this time, I don't believe offers that um, that service. So <clears throat> with that, I want to go ahead and, and turn really the, the meat of the presentation over to, to, to Rich to, to, to really start to get into the specifics of our approach uh, to this feasibility study. As we get into our project approach, it's, uh, it's important to recognize, obviously, this project is not just a, an engineering undertaking, but it's a, it's a project that's going to affect the community as a whole. So yeah, in, in approaching the project, it, uh, we recognize there's a large number of stakeholders that will have to be involved and engaged uh, right from the, the initial kickoff meeting of the, the feasibility study. Uh, beginning with the, the city administration, a number of city officials, obviously plan operation staff, public work staff. City engineering staff, aldermen, uh, regulatory agencies that will have to be engaged on uh, effluent limits as we evaluate the alternatives on, on the various processes at both North and South Plant. 
and also a number of environmental stakeholders that will uh, request opportunities to review the alternatives as they impact uh, discharge to the Salt Creek. Um, I'll briefly cover our uh, project approach overview and as we get into it, a little more technical discussion at both the North and the South plant, uh, we'll get a little more uh, in-depth discussion on each of these items. Uh, initially, when we uh, set up our kickoff meeting, uh, the plant operations staff will obviously be involved in that and we'll go through an initial data collection and uh, information gathering session. Uh, from that, we'll be able to establish uh, a baseline existing condi condition scenario for uh, the existing wastewater situation within the community. Uh, obviously, the two combined treatment plants are capable of treating up to 3.1 million gallons per day. We'll need to review historically the information over the last 10 years and evaluate the trending on that, uh, on the wastewater influent and wastewater loads to those treatment facilities. Um, in looking at uh, the future of wastewater treatment, it'll be important that we engage uh, any community development officials, economic development officials, those that would have been involved in any uh, comprehensive planning efforts or future comprehensive planning efforts, specifically with any target growth development corridors, uh, specifically the Elgin O'Hare Expressway and Redevelopment Corridors. Uh, those will play uh, critical factors in, in refining the, the future wastewater projections and future wastewater needs of the community. Um, typically, we'll take a look at uh, CMAP, the county. They have published projections as far as where they expect the community to, to grow demographically over the, the next few years. Uh, in our initial workshop, we want to engage the, the public officials to refine a, a projection that makes sense for the city of Wooddale. Uh, after we get through the initial uh, data gathering phase, uh, our first step would be to do an in-plan assessment and, uh, and going through and evaluating the, the true capacities of each of the unit processes within the wastewater facility. And from that, uh, our team has access to a hydraulic and biological, it's called a BioWind modeling software, where we can take the information as we interview the plant operation staff on each unit process and, and verify that through hydraulic modeling software. This also provides us a tool to look at, there may be specific processes at, at either of the plants that may be able to accommodate additional loadings. Uh, in identifying those, we can propose stress testing the treatment plants. Um, and that would be a, an avenue to approach the EPA. If we can identify a certain process that can handle increased flows and loadings, we can peti petition the EPA to potentially uh, allow an increased uh, treatment limit on, on those processes. And as we get into the, uh, the meat of the over meat of the study, uh, we'll obviously be looking at a number of alternatives to meet the city's ultimate objective, which is uh, to ultimately treat up to five million gallons per day of, of wastewater. Um, <clears throat> and as we go through that process, uh, there'll be a number of workshops where, as the engineering team will select initially the alternatives that make the most sense for the city, and through those workshops with the public officials, we'll be able to refine and prioritize those alternatives uh, that make sense for the long-term uh, objectives of the community. Um, the team brings uh, experience, recent experience, uh, in prioritizing those alternatives, both economically and non-economically. Uh, some examples of some recent projects that have uh, been through engineering and, and constructed and allow us to effectively cost estimate these projects or uh, wastewater and treatment improvement projects for the village of Richmond, city of McHenry, Salt Creek Sanitary District uh, from Walter Deutschler Associates, and then also the city of Plano uh, wastewater treatment plant expansion. And as we uh, further develop and uh, refine, refine and select an ultimate al alternative, uh, this will ultimately be crafted into a facility planning document format. Uh, that's ultimately the, the next step after this initial feasibility study and the effort that we go through and the final recommendations report will be prepared in the format, a draft FPA format, which will uh, ultimately translate over to a, a future FPA submittal to the, the Illinois EPA and CMAP. <coughs> a number of the project challenges that uh, we've identified in, uh, in the feasibility study, first off are the site constraints, obviously both the north plant and the site plant are limited on, uh, on expansion area. Um, there's a number of process challenges. When we uh, went on the site tour earlier this year with the, the plant operations staff, 
there's a, a number of process challenges that need to be uh, corrected and considered as part of the overall improvement plan uh, in meeting the wastewater objectives. And another item is constructability. How can we maintain and meet current wastewater effluent limits while we implement uh, new processes? And as we go through uh, the process, it's important that we keep regulatory and environmental advocacy gr groups engaged in the overall process. And at this point, to discuss a little more in depth on some of the, the process challenges, uh, specifically starting off with the site constraints at the South Plant, I'll turn the discussion over to Ed Coggin. Hello. And what we see on the screen now is an aerial photograph of the South Plant. And as uh, everybody's familiar with it, the uh, main treatment components, the aeration basins and digesters are on the east side or the right side of the slide uh, next to the access drive that goes through the residential area and through the golf course. Then uh, go further to the west, we end up with our disinfection uh, area and then the, the plant headworks and then the excess flow facility and then the receiving stream where the effluent discharges. This plant is located right in the middle of the golf course, the forest preserved golf course. And one of the things that that does, it allows for the possibility for uh, one thing up here is effluent reuse. It's something we've implemented at other facilities where we had um, this opportunity. It's worked out real well as a way to um, reduce the total effluent that is going into the receiving stream and also provide less expensive water for irrigating at the golf courses themselves. Uh, while we were there at the, the site walkthrough, we did notice some of the, the you know, or the challenges, the process challenges that we had down at the facility. And uh, some of the main ones there were dealing with uh, the headworks facility itself. Uh, there were some issues with uh, the grit removal and the screening units and the operations involved there. The excess flow system that was built in the, in the 80s really hasn't seen much use. Um, the plant loading at the south plant, it's really seeing about half of the flow rate that it was designed to see. And um, because of the amount of development that really hasn't occurred uh, within its collection system. It is connected to the north plant where it can receive excess flow, but that operation is a difficult one to, to, to monitor and maintain. So there is an opportunity there of looking at possibly doing something with the, the room that the excess flow system is taking up or with those structures themselves. And then at the, at the plant, the chlorine disinfection system, um, you know, may lead to potential problems in the future with, uh, or even currently with a disinfection byproducts. So there's some opportunities there to look at uh, different alternatives for that. Uh, UV disinfection being one that we've had real good luck with at a number of other facilities. But one of the biggest opportunities we have at that South Plant though is the effluent reuse. And there's an opportunity to probably irrigate during the summer month when it's needed on the order of about 400,000 gallons a day, what the typical golf course will use. And that would be, you know, about half of the flow rate that is coming into the plant currently. So it would be um, a very good use of that and would greatly reduce the amount of effluent going into the receiving streams. A number of the environmental groups and the um, IEPA have been really encouraging and uh, the use of limiting or for reducing the amount of treated effluent that does get discharged through any means possible. And this would be a real good one. Um, we're not really recommending using it for any other alternatives than just irrigation at the local discharge point itself. So um, that covers most of the things at the south plant, and I think we're going to be going into the north plant site constraints, and Mark Holm will be discussing those. Thank you, Ed. Good evening. Let's see a uh, bird's eye view of the north plant, and the north plant uh, does have some um, site constraint issues with Salt Creek to the east, the railroad tracks to the north, the lumber yard to the west, and Irving Park Road to the south. When we were out at the site, um, Brad and his staff were kind enough to take us through each one of his unit processes so we can evaluate them, listen to his operator's concerns, and then try to develop um, an approach to dealing with each one of the issues that he's currently having. When we talk about a plant, we talk about a, a treatment train. And the beginning of the process is the headworks. That's where the heavy material is removed from the wastewater. We screen it, 
Uh, we pump it, and then it goes to a grit removal facility. And at the north plant, there's also an excess flow facility. If there's a rainfall and there's a lot of infiltration and inflow into the system, some flows could be diverted to that facility, be provided with a, a limited amount of treatment, and then blended back with the effluent from the rest of the plant and discharged to the creek. Really, the main component of any uh, wastewater treatment facility is the activated sludge process. And the activated sludge process is a process, a biological process. There's bacteria that are alive within that process, and we have to create the right environment in that process by giving the bacteria food, the waste, and air so they can metabolize the waste into things that are uh, innocuous like carbon dioxide, water, and nitrate. And we refer to the bacteria as, in the industry as bugs. You've got to have good bugs in your process for it to work properly. And you have to have enough detention time and enough volume to uh, be able to uh, treat the waste. And then after those bugs leave the process, we settle them because they're fat and they're happy. They've reproduced. We settle them in final clarifiers. We return some of them back to the process so they can eat and multiply some more and the effluent from the final clarifier gets disinfected. And finally, the, the waste product is, uh, is digested. And basically, what we're doing after the bugs are nice and fat and happy, we starve them so they cannibalize one another. And that, in a nutshell, is how the process works. And now I'd like to just walk you through just some of the things that we, we took down as notes when we were walking through the process with uh, with Brad and his staff and some of the ideas that we had on how we might be able to address some of the, the problems. Um, the influent pipe to the, uh, to the plant is uh, restricted, which uh, causes some, some issues in the collection system and also can, causes some issues with their screening system. Now, if you can't catch that debris on the screen, what's gonna happen? It's gonna overflow, get into the pumping system, potentially damage one of the pumps. And when do you need your pumps and your equipment to work best? It's when you're under direct.